Cheers, guys. Epics 911, welcome to episode one of Virtual Reality A to Z. Calling this episode The Beginning. And I'm calling it that for a pretty big reason. Look, we could find so many different areas in history, point to them and say, if this hadn't happened, well, it wouldn't have got us to virtual reality. And I'm not kidding. There's not a few of these. There's dozens upon dozens of these points in time. We can't cover them all or this series would be, you know, years long. So we got to find a point in time to start the story of virtual reality. And the best place to start VR, in my opinion, is just after the Great Depression. So to truly begin to understand virtual reality, we're going to have to do a little time traveling. Like I said, we could go back centuries due to the way technology evolves and we can make an argument for so many different time periods and say this or that is going to lead to VR but that's going to require way more time than we have. So to keep things moving along, let's instead go to the early 40s and 1950s and explore how that era, just after the Great Depression, played such an important role. We're going to look in on a young man by the name of Morton Heilig. During this era, he's in his 20s, and he absolutely loves going to the cinema to watch movies. However, let's get back to Morton in a minute. First, let's check out this era a bit. Let's try to understand what made it so special. I mentioned the Great Depression. That was a global economic depression that took place in the 1930s. It started out in the US and spread throughout the globe. On its own, it's a super interesting time in history. And again, we could spend a lot of time on that. We won't. So in summary, let's just say the Great Depression was global, and most importantly, it impacted everyone. Rich, poor, like the Black Death, it did not care. No one was spared. Cities all around the world were not only hit, they were hit hard, particularly those engaging in heavy industry. So after the Great Depression, movie ticket sales slow down and an emerging technology called the television set begins to amaze people. Here is a device that allowed you to bring a movie screen home with you. Sure, it wasn't as big, but the concept of being able to do that, absolutely mind-blowing back then. To combat this rise of the television set, the studios and theater owners, they resorted to a wide variety of different marketing tactics. Cheap tricks, uh, manufacturing of mystery, all in an attempt to get people to fill all those empty seats. One technology was 3D, and if you're shocked that it existed way back in the 50s, we're just getting started. And speaking of shock, many don't realize how natural the fit for horror games and VR was, or how pivotal an actor by the name of Vincent Price, who's now known for a lot of campy horror stuff, how pivotal he was to today's virtual reality. So let's get back to young Morton. He's watching movies pretty much whenever he's got the funds and free time to watch them. Movies at the time, the most immersive media available to people. The other alternative was radio and your imagination, equally pretty cool. But here was this ability to watch people, like in real life, on a screen that was massive in front of you, with audio and just amazing musical scores. It was the most immersive media of the day. But for Morton, it still wasn't quite enough. New technologies related to movies have him super excited. So when we join Morton, we see him, it's 1953, he's 27 years old, he's lined up for a movie, an important movie, called House of Wax. And what makes this movie so special is that it is one of the first 3D movies released. Now the plot was pretty bog standard stuff, 
even by today's measurements. But for Morton, it wasn't about the plot. It was the technology, the 3D that was being used. Now, Morton is blown away by the 3D effects and he scribbles note after note down after the movie, all of which would contribute to a very important paper that he wrote in 1955 called The Cinema of the Future. He then starts building what he refers to as Sensorama in 1957. Now, it's still lacking a lot of the features that he would add after 1959. And most of Morty's friends, they think the guy is one short of a full nut bar. I mean, he's going on about stuff they can't even imagine as if it were possible. So what was so special about 1959? Well, it saw the release of yet another Vincent Price film. This one was called The Tingler. And The Tingler was a guignol film, and that was simply a label that implied there was going to be a combo of horror, suspense, and gore. Alongside this movie's release, marketing dollars and material from a fella by the name of William Castle, he was a director, producer, and a sometime movie pitch writer, while well, they were going towards describing the Precepto, which was a theater chair that over the last few decades has suffered from a bunch of false rumors. One of those William didn't do a lot to try and dispel was that it would shock patrons. He even included that in his writing. In reality, it was much like today's D-Box seats. It was actually a bumper box used to de-ice airplane wings and when installed in a chair, produced a rattling under the seat, not a shock. However, like I said, Castle embellished the device's functionality and in his writing would say stuff like, you too will feel every shocking sensation through Percepto, and then a bunch of exclamation marks, insinuating, of course, that the device would shock people. Sure enough, the Tingler in 1959 provided inspiration for the functionality Heilig was missing for his sensorama, that of smell and feel. And that's where we're going to leave off in this episode and where we will resume in episode two when we take a look at Morton Heilig's Sensorama. <laughs>